Hey YouTube, this is James of Last Art Games. This is Lights Out. Made by Tiger Electronics in 1995, I was obsessed with this game as a kid. It was given to me one Christmas from an aunt, and I would spend hours trying to solve board after board. Well, today, we're going to try to solve this game. The way the game works is pretty simple. It's a 5x5 grid of buttons that can be either lit or not. When you press any button, that button and any adjacent buttons are toggled either on or off. And the point of the game is to turn out all the lights in a specific number of moves. We're going to completely solve this game by determining the best move for any possible configuration. The general strategy we're going to try is to map every possible board to a network. A network in this sense is a collection of objects with connections between them. This is most often shown as a set of circles with lines drawn between them. In our case, each of these circles, called nodes, is going to represent a lights out board. Then we can connect each of these nodes with edges to show how one board can move from one to another by pressing of a button. Once we have all the configurations mapped and connected, we can determine what is the shortest path between any two game states. Basically, we can use network theory to find the shortest path from our current state to solved, where all the lights are out. Now, I'm going to be implementing this work in Python, and I'll make all the code and research work available on GitHub for anyone interested. With that, let's get started. Before we can do anything, we have to model the state of the board. The most straightforward solution would be to use a list of lists filled with booleans. There are advantages of doing it this way. We can index the list to find the state of any specific button, for example. But here is actually where we run into our first problem. If I take my list of lists and check the size of the object in memory, it ends up being about 1.2 kilobytes. That doesn't seem like a lot, but if we're going to map every single possible game state for a 5x5 grid, our 1.2 kilobyte board ends up being about 42 gigs in memory. Yeah, we're going to need something a little better than that. This is where the humble integer comes into play. An integer is only 24 bytes in memory. Multiplied by our unique state count, we're just under a gig of memory. Much more manageable. But how are we going to map out our 5x5 board to an integer? By thinking in binary. We have our board of true and falses. We can index these individual buttons as 0 through 24. We can also think of each true as a 1 and each false as a 0. Then we just translate all of our ones and zeros into a binary integer. But how do we simulate button presses with just an integer? It would be much easier if we had a fully fleshed out object. Yes, it would be easier, but we have to keep thinking small if we're going to map out our network. Fortunately, there's a binary operator that gives us just what we need. Let's think about what happens when you push a button. If we map our board to a binary number, then we're basically flipping specific bits. This is where we can use the exclusive OR operator, or XOR. XOR works by outputting a 1 if the two inputs are different, and outputting a 0 if they are the same. This behavior can actually be used as a toggle. If we start with a binary pattern, here 11011, and XOR it against a number with a 1 in each bit that we want to toggle, here, 00111, we flip those bits and get the output that we're looking for. So we can create a mask to simulate the effect of each button press. Then, if we XOR our current state against that mask, we'll get the new state after the button press. This is what our button press from earlier would look like through this process. So now we have a memory efficient way to represent our game states. We have a process for moving between states. Now we are ready to put all of this into a network graph. Because I'm in Python, we're going to use the package network x. It's a pretty effective way of building out these data structures, and it has the soon to be helpful function called shortest path. Let's load all of our states and connect them to one another. Uh, oh no, no, come on, you can do it. Ah, no. <sighs> Fine. 
Apparently, mapping all of our states in a network graph was too memory intensive, even though we're just using integers. So we're not done yet. We'll just do the search for the shortest path ourselves, without a wonderfully interconnected network graph. We're going to implement our own breadth-first search. A breadth-first search is one way to traverse a network. Basically, at our starting node, we explore to all the connected nodes. All of those nodes are one step away, so I'm calling them layer one. Then from all the nodes in layer one, we look at all the nodes connected to them. These are all two steps away from our start, so layer two. And so on and so forth, we search through the network until we come across the node we're looking for. In our case, this will be the solve state. Searching this way guarantees that we find the shortest path from where we started to where we're going. The way we're implementing this search is through using two objects, a dictionary and a queue. A dictionary is basically a lookup. We can input the key, which our case is a game state, and get something else. A queue is just like the name suggests, a queue. We put objects in on the right side and take them out on the left side. So we'll process objects in the order they were put in. We'll start by putting our current state in the queue. It'll be processed and give us all the boards that it can transition to, our layer one. A relationship for all these nodes will be put into our dictionary, basically saying for this new state, here is where I came from. Then we take all of our new states that we haven't visited yet and put them in the queue. And we just repeat this process over and over again, slowly working through the queue and new states discovered until we stumble on the solved state. Once we find it, we can use the dictionary to get the path that'll lead us to the solved state. And like that, we found our solution. So let's go through the list of all possible game states and run it through our algorithm. I'll just get this started and we can wait. This is going to take a while. See any good movies lately? So I finally got a new Super Famicom game I was searching for. Yeah, it's uh, Sailor... I'm an idiot. I just realized I'm doing this backwards. Rather than going through every single game state until we find the solution, we should start with the solution and find every single state that leads to it. If we build off from the solution, we can find every possible state that will lead to it. In our previous attempt, we were doing a full search just to get one path. By doing this in reverse, we are getting every possible path in one go. Changing how we build our dataset is gonna save us a significant amount of time. Our goal is get a path to solution for every single possible game state. Running a full breadth first search is a very expensive algorithm. It takes a lot of time to run. I let our original algorithm run for a full hour and it only solved a few states. However, when I reversed our approach and worked from the solve state out, it only took several minutes to get every possible path to solution. An interesting discovery of this method is that not all lights out game states are solvable. Exactly half of all the possible configurations cannot be solved and don't have a path to the solved state. In our earlier approach, we would still look for a solution for these boards and end up just wasting a lot of time. Now that we have a solid method of finding the shortest path to solved, I've wrapped everything up into a single application. This is the lights out solver. At the start of the application, you click on Load Solutions. If this is the first time running the application, the solutions will be generated and saved to disk. Then, every time after, you will only load up the solutions already created. Once everything is loaded, you get two new buttons, New and Solve. New lets you enter the board that you want to solve. Using the checkboxes, you add a check to each light that is on. Once you have everything set, click on Solve. You'll be given a set of instructions and representations of what the board will look like. Follow the steps to solve the board in the fastest path possible. If your board is unsolvable, the application will let you know.
All of the code for this application is available on GitHub. If you're interested in running the application yourself or just curious of how it was made, please check it out there. Finally, let's use this application to solve a game. And that's it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more.